Welcome back to DIY Garage. I'm your host, Carrie Holzman. You know, it's that time of year again, the season of love. Valentine's Day is right around the corner. And of course, that means it's time to open up the wallet and buy cards and candies and flowers. But I think this year, we should treat ourselves to a box better than chocolates. The benefit of building your own computer is you can customize it to meet your individual needs. Today, we're going to build sort of a jack-of-all-trades, no-compromises build. And in doing so, I've selected these components to accomplish pretty much any task you want to do with your computer without any compromises. For example, video editing, photo editing, even gaming, 1080 gaming for any game that's currently on the market will be no problem for this computer. Now, these are the components that are going to make up this build. Starting with the case, we've got Corsair's best-selling case, the 200R. And there's a reason why it's their best-selling case. It's priced very competitively. It's got a lot of rooms for options and upgrades. It runs very cool, and it also runs very quiet. For the motherboard, we're using Gigabyte's H170 D3HP. That just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It's a socket 1151, which tells us, of course, that's going to be an Intel Skylake-based computer. And that also tells us it's going to require DDR4 memory. For our CPU, we've selected Intel's Core i7-6700. It runs at a very respectable 3.4 gigahertz. And for the RAM, we've got Corsair's Vengeance LPX RAM. This is a 32 gig kit, meaning there are four RAM modules that are paired at eight gigs a piece. And so we've got four of them. That's actually gonna fill all the memory slots on this board. For our video card, we've got EVGA's GeForce GTX 960. And this video card, well, it's not a top of the line card. It will play all the AAA titles out there, all the games. Uh, certainly at 1080 without any problem, some even higher than that on the resolutions. Now we've decided to go ahead and add a Wi-Fi card to this build to give it even more versatility so that it can be placed in a room where perhaps uh, a cable can't reach so that you can access your Wi-Fi router. And if you're building this system and you don't have any need for that, this is an optional component you don't have to include if you don't need it. Now to power everything, we've got Corsair's CX750M power supply. It's 750 watts, semi-modular, so that we're only going to use the cables that we need, and that's going to make our cabling look much, much cleaner inside the computer. For storage, we've selected Crucial's BX200. This is a entry-level and very affordable solid-state drive at 480 gigabytes total capacity. And for our optical drive, we've got Lighton's DVD CD Reader Writer. So of course, it will read and write both CDs and DVDs. Now for all these components to work together, we need an operating system. And for that, we've selected Microsoft's Windows 10, the 64-bit Home Premium Edition. As you can see from the ingredients in front of me, this is a sure recipe for a box that's gonna be a lot sweeter than chocolates. Now the first part of building a computer is prepping our case, and you're not gonna believe just how simple this really is. What we have to do, first of all, is to remove these two side panels from the case. There are two screws that secure each side panel Pull the side panel back about an inch and pull it away from the case and then put it away somewhere safe where you're not going to trip over it or scratch it or dent it. Located inside the case, you'll see we've got this box which we're going to remove. It contains all the screws and other hardware required for mounting our components. Now to install our DVD drive, we've got to push out one of these front bay covers and then grab the optical drive. We're going to slide that in and there's a little tab here on the side which I'm going to pull out until I feel the drive click and lock itself into position. Next, I'm going to grab the Crucial BX200 480 gig solid state drive and I'm going to install it right here in this lower left corner. There's room for up to four solid state drives that don't require any tools. Next, we're going to open the motherboard box and remove the I.O. shield. Now the I.O. shield is going to mount from the inside of the case. It's just a friction fit. Make sure that the big round hole, which is for your keyboard, faces up and it just snaps right into position. The final step in prepping our case is to install our power supply. So as we unbox the power supply, we want to orient it with the fan facing down because the fan actually sucks air in. So it's also important when you're using your computer that you don't have it on thick carpeting where the power supply won't be able to breathe. Place it under the lip and press it back until it's flush with the motherboard tray and then slide it back until it's flush with the rear of the case. Now to secure the power supply into position, we're going to use the screws that came with the power supply and we put one screw in each corner. You'll notice that one corner is slightly offset. Now let's go ahead and move the case out of the way and clear our workspace because the next step is prepping our motherboard. And for that, we need our motherboard, CPU, and RAM. Everything up until this point that we've done, there was no threat of electrostatic discharge or ESD. Where the threat comes in is in the preparation of the motherboard, and even that, it's a minor threat. Now, if you have an anti-static strap, this is a good time to go ahead and put that on. 
If you don't have one, you can pick one up for a couple of bucks here at Newegg. On the other hand, you could simply handle the parts as I demonstrate, hold everything by the edges, try to avoid touching the tops or the bottoms of any of the components, and there won't be any electrostatic discharge with the parts are handled correctly, anti-static strap or not. So I'm gonna place the motherboard here on top of the motherboard box. It's not anti-static, but it's non-conductive. And what we wanna do is we wanna grab the CPU and take it out of the box. You'll see the CPU is in its own separate plastic container. This is also an ESD protected container. And there's a little ridge to it. And if you get your thumb under it, you can lift that up and you'll see there's little notches in the plastic. That's for your fingers to go. So you can pick that CPU up by its edges to know which direction the CPU goes into the socket. Since it only goes in one way, there are two telltale signs. One is a small arrow indicated on the corner of the CPU and on the corner of the socket on the motherboard. The other way, the way I prefer, is to notice where the notches on the CPU are and line them up with the notches in the motherboard socket. Now to expose the socket on the motherboard, press down the retention lever, push it away from its catch, and lift the top up. Note where the notches are on the socket and align the CPU accordingly and gently set the CPU into the socket. Next, lower the retention lever over the top of the CPU and slide it back under the catch, and you'll see that top plastic cover should automatically pop off. I recommend you take that top plastic piece and stick it in your empty motherboard box along with all your other spare parts. Having that piece is very important because if you ever have to send the motherboard back to the manufacturer for warranty, anytime a CPU has been removed from the socket, that socket must be covered because the little delicate pins in the socket are very, very fragile. Next, we're going to grab our OEM heat sink and fan, and we're going to remove that plastic cover that's been protecting our thermal compound that's been pre-applied by the manufacturer. Now, some people think a third-party fan is necessary. I completely disagree. If you're not overclocking the CPU, and this CPU technically is not overclockable, and the motherboard we're using is not intended for overclocking, then in my opinion and in my experience, a third-party fan is not necessary, and the, the current fan, regardless of how you use the computer for gaming or video editing, is more than adequate to last the life of the computer. The CPU fan can go on in any direction and will work equally well. So I consider where the cable has to plug into the motherboard so that I can keep my cabling as clean as possible. In this case, the CPU fan will have its wording what will appear to be upside down. However, because our case has no window, it really doesn't make a difference. Nobody's going to see it. The CPU fan has four plastic towers you want to line those up with the mounting holes surrounding the CPU socket. Press down on one of the towers until it clicks into position, then do the opposite corner, and then repeat for the remaining two. Next, grab the CPU fan power cable and plug it into the CPU fan header on the motherboard. Now, we can install our RAM. The first step is to make sure that you move the retention levers of the memory sockets on the motherboard into their open position. Look for the notch in the memory. Line it up with the notch in the memory socket on the board. This ensures that the memory only goes in one direction. Gently set it into its track. Use your thumbs, push down on one corner until it clicks into position, and then the other corner. And repeat this for the remaining memory modules. Installing our motherboard into the case is also a very simple task, but it's also really important that you pay attention to the little details. In this particular instance, we wanna make sure that the standoffs that are in our case line up with the mounting holes on the motherboard. Now, some cases don't have standoffs pre-installed. Sometimes they're in the bag of screws and accessories, and you have to put them in the right positions. Now, the Corsair 200R already has all the standoffs installed in the right place, but here's how you can verify it, and you always should verify it. We count the number of holes on the board. So we've got two on the bottom, three in the middle, two on the top. Now, on the Corsair case, inside we've got three up the, up the middle and three down one side. The other side is... Uh, for a larger motherboard, so they'll be outside the range of this board, so we just ignore those three on the very end. And what we're going to do is what I call a dry fit. And what we do is we lay the case down onto its side, and grabbing the motherboard by the heatsink, which is the safest place to pick it up, line up the ports with the I.O. shield, slide it back and into position, and then look through each of the motherboard holes to verify you can see the standoff behind it. What we don't want to have is a standoff that doesn't line up with a hole. That's why we count them. If I counted seven standoffs, and I've got six holes, that means there's one hidden back there that's probably going to short something out, and that's going to be a bad day. Now, to secure the motherboard into position, we want to grab the screws that came with the bag of accessories that were included with the case. And the screws we're looking for are the short, coarse-threaded screws. Get all five screws started, then go ahead and tighten them down. Don't torque them down too tight. They should just be snug. You'll notice that the center hole doesn't accept a screw because it's actually a special standoff that holds the motherboard into the correct position for you 
so that you don't have to have three hands to get it installed. Now we've reached the point of the build that scares a lot of people, the wiring. The wiring freaks a lot of people out, but you know what? It's really not a big deal. Everything that we've done so far was easy, just like I said, right? Well, the wiring doesn't have to be difficult either if we just take it one wire at a time. The first thing we want to do is we want to remove all the wire ties that are in the system right now. The reason we want to remove those is they contain metal inside of them. And as you transport the system around and as they age, they become brittle. If they were to break loose, they could short something out. We don't want any metal in there. Start by grabbing the large 24-pin power connector coming off the power supply. We're going to run that through this hole here in the back of the case to help hide the wiring. Now, you don't have to do this, but if you want your computer to look nice and clean on the inside, that's what these holes are here for. And then up through another hole here and bring it back in and plug it into the large 24-pin power connector on the motherboard. This connector only goes on one way and it has a clip that will click into position when it's fully seated. You can give the cable a light tug just to ensure it doesn't fall off. If it does, you didn't have it plugged in all the way. Next, grab the remaining power supply cable. That's the 8-pin CPU power. Again, we can run it through one of the cable management holes in the back of the case to help hide the wire. We're going to bring this cable up all the way to the top right corner. It's going to go on to the top 8-pin connector here on the top left of the motherboard, again with the clip facing the outside of the motherboard. Now we can apply power to our drives. And to do that, we're going to go to the bag of cables that came with our power supply and locate the power cable that has the SATA power connectors on it. Plug the end of the cable into the power supply anywhere where it says peripheral and SATA. Then I'm going to plug one of the SATA cables into the back of the solid state drive and the other SATA power connector into the back of our optical drive. Depending on your case and your cable length, you may choose to use the wiring holes to hide the cable as much as possible, again for keeping that clean look. Now it's time for us to hook up our hard drive LED, power LED, reset switch, and power switch. And Gigabyte has made this process a lot easier by including this little accessory they call a G connector. And G, that's a great connector. Let me tell you, this makes this whole process so much easier. Simply grab the hard drive LED cable, look for the indicator that shows which side of the cable is positive, and line it up where it says HD, and make sure that the positive side of the cable faces the outside edge of the connector. Then grab the power LED cable. Make sure that the positive matches the positive side on the G connector, and it'll just lock into position right over that hard drive LED connector. Next, grab your reset switch cable. Now, switches don't have positive or negative. They do say positive and negative, but you can ignore that. Then just above that, we're going to do the same thing with our power switch cable. Now, all these cables are on a single plug, and you can simply push that straight on to the front port panel header of the motherboard, and now two-thirds of your cabling is already done. Next, we're going to hook up our front port audio connectors, and you'll see that it has one of the pins blocked, and that's to ensure you can only plug it on one direction. So go ahead and route the cable as cleanly as you can using the routing holes provided, and plug it into the motherboard where it says HD Audio. The final front port cable we've got to hook up is our USB 3.0. So again, using the holes in the back of the case to route your cable accordingly to hide it as best you can, run it through to one of these two connectors on this motherboard. Either one will work equally well. Now you've hooked up all your front port umbilicals just that easy. Now we can move on to the fans. The Corsair 200R comes with two fans already installed. We have a front fan and a rear exhaust fan. The H170 D3HP motherboard from Gigabyte has three fan headers on it. Now, it doesn't matter which fan you plug into which header, we're actually going to have an extra header. The way we choose which header to use for which fan is simply what's closest to keep our cabling as clean as possible. Now, back in the motherboard box, locate your two SATA data cables. They're almost identical, just that one end of one cable has a 90 degree bend on it. Go ahead and take that cable and set it out to the side and grab the other cable and plug one end of it where it says SATA 0 on your motherboard and take the other end of the cable and plug it into the back of our crucial solid state drive. Grab the remaining SATA cable and plug the straight end of it into SATA port 1. Now if you're using a different motherboard than what I'm showing in this tutorial, be sure and check your motherboard manual to determine SATA port 0 and 1's locations. Finally, take the other end of the cable, that one with the 90 degree end, and plug it straight onto the back of the optical drive. Now here's where things get exciting because now we can do our very first test boot. Now some of you may be asking, how can you test boot without a video card in place? Well the reason is, remember the CPU we used? Well Intel's got integrated graphics into the CPU called Intel HD Graphics 530 on the Core i7-6700 that we have here. That means the video card chip is included with the CPU. And the motherboard has the DVI, VGA, and HDMI outputs built into the motherboard. They just don't work if you put in a CPU that doesn't have the built-in chip. So because we have all that, 
we can test boot with the onboard video. In fact, if you're not a gamer, if, you don't, if you're not video editing and you don't need a discrete graphics card, many people just use the onboard graphics for everyday web surfing and general use. We've got just a few things plugged in. We've got the monitor plugged in with the DVI cable. We've got a keyboard and mouse plugged in to the USB ports. And we've got power plugged in. Now I'm going to go ahead and make sure the switch on the power supply is flipped into the on position. And now I'm going to reach over and turn this machine on. This is the first time we've turned it on. If we did everything right, we should see the power light come on. I see the fan is spinning here. I see both, all three fans, CPU fan, front fan, rear fan are spinning like they're supposed to. We need to give this just a minute to initialize and we should see the screen uh, acknowledge that we have no bootable device. And that's because we haven't installed our operating system yet and that's what we want to see. Or the BIOS screen may come up. Uh, depends from one machine to the next uh, what happens here. But it's important you give it a good minute or two. If more than two minutes goes by, go ahead and hold the power button in until the machine shuts off or simply flip the switch on the back of the power supply because you're going to have some diagnosing to do. Something didn't install correctly or you've got a bad part. Now the message you see here on the screen that says reboot and select proper boot device, that's the message we want to see. That tells us that everything is passed power on self-test and it's trying to boot to the hard drive. But the hard drive is brand new out of the box. We haven't installed an operating system on it yet. But it verifies everything we've done so far, we have done correctly. So now we can go ahead and turn it back off and disconnect all the cabling here and continue on with our build. Believe it or not, the assembly of your computer is almost complete. I told you it was going to be easy. And these final steps are even easier. Installing your video card is very simple and most video cards have some plastic wrapped around them to protect them in shipping. We want to make sure we remove all of that before we install the graphics card. Now you're going to want to install your graphics card in your fastest PCI Express slot and that's generally the topmost slot on every motherboard and that's no different on this board. You'll see the edge of the slot has a retention lever. We want to make sure that's in the open position before we attempt to install the card. Now before we permanently install the graphics card, we want to align the graphics card connector with the motherboard PCI Express connector so the grooves line up and just check to see which of the PCI backplates you have to remove. On this case, we have to remove the second and third ones from the top. Go ahead and put those backplates in your motherboard box because you might need them in the future. Next, take the graphics card, plug it into the connector and make sure it's fully seated and you should see that little retention lever close. Next, take those screws we just removed and secure the card into position. Going back to those cables that were included with our power supply, we want to look for ones that are labeled PCIe. We just need one cable. One end of the power cable plugs into the back of the power supply where it says 6 plus 2 PCIe. Now the other end of this power cable has two power connectors on it. Some video cards require two power connectors, but this video card only requires one. Now you'll see there are six pins and then there's an additional two pins. If we put those together, it forms eight pins. And that 8-pin connector is only going to go on in one direction, and it's going to plug in here on the side of the video card. All that's left is installing our Wi-Fi adapter. This is very simple, and these Wi-Fi adapters are completely optional. If you need wireless internet access, then you must have a wireless router, and you must have some kind of a Wi-Fi card. Some motherboards come with them built in. You can also buy them USB. I only recommend the USB adapters if you only need to use Wi-Fi once in a while you'll see that it, the antennas are not yet connected. And that's to make the installation a lot simpler. You'll also notice the connector on this card is much smaller. This is called a PCI Express by one or times one connector. And it will actually fit into a full-size PCI Express slot, but what a waste of that slot. So to make our installation easier and to not block the airflow from the fans on the video card, we're going to use the PCI Express by one connector that's just above the video card. So first we're going to go ahead and remove this screw that's holding in this backplate cover. Slide the card into its slot until it's fully seated, and then use the screw to secure that into position. We're going to grab these antennas, screw them here on the back, and go ahead and, and adjust the antennas however you wish to get the best signal. The assembly of the computer is now complete, or at least it will be if it passes the next power on self-test. As you can see, I've got the monitor back out, as well as the keyboard and mouse, and those are plugged in back to the computer. However, be, pay very careful attention to plug the monitor into your video card this time, don't plug it into your motherboard video, or you could get a false result. Don't plug anything else into the case. No flash drives, no internet. We're going to flip the switch on the back of the power supply back to the on position. I always put it in the off position when I'm working inside of the computer, even when it's unplugged, just for extra safety. You can never be too careful. Now I'm going to go ahead and reach over and hit the power button, and hopefully we'll see a message on the screen saying it's still unable to boot. Only this time that message will be coming from our 
discrete graphics card. So as you can see on the screen, we've got the reboot or select proper boot device message again. That's exactly what we wanted to see. So we can go ahead and turn the machine back off. Now, at this point, we can flash the BIOS, which we covered in the previous build video, so I won't cover that again. You don't have to do it in most cases. I prefer to do it before I install the operating system to make sure I have the latest BIOS installed to prevent any problem that the newer BIOS could resolve. All right, well, here we are. We've got Windows 10 already installed. I've gone ahead and activated it and downloaded all the updates, including installing all the latest drivers for our hardware and did the cable management and cleaned it up, made it look nice and pretty, and that's it. It's done. It really was that easy. Now, you might be asking yourself, what kind of performance can a rig like this deliver? Well, let's let the benchmarks speak for themselves. So this Valentine's Day, wouldn't you rather get this box than a box of chocolates? And it'll last a lot longer too. That's going to wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new along the way. Please remember to click the like button and subscribe. And check out our new video shopping channel, Newegg.tv. I'm Kerry Holzman for Newegg TV and DIY Garage, and we'll see you next time.